Hello, I'm Cheryl McCarthy of the City University of New York. Welcome to One to One. Each week, we address issues of timely and timeless concern with newsmakers and the journalists who report on them, with artists, writers, scientists, educators, social scientists, activists, government leaders. We speak with each one to one. I'm delighted to welcome back journalist Lynn Povich, writer, editor, and revolutionary. She started out as a secretary at Newsweek and rose to become the first woman senior editor in the magazine's history. She's had a distinguished career as a journalist since then, and it's led to her latest work, The Good Girls Revolt, How the Women of Newsweek Suit Their Bosses and Change the Workplace. Welcome back. Thanks, Cheryl. So you hold this press conference in March 1970 announcing uh, the lawsuit against Newsweek, and all 46 of you are, are, are sitting there? Okay. So what kind of response did you get from your colleagues and from the top brass? You know, the men we worked with every day, the writers and many of the reporters, we were extremely supportive because they knew the work we did. You know, they saw our reporting, they saw that we kept their mistakes out of the magazine, and we pretty, had pretty, very good relationships with them. Uh, like many organizations, a lot of the discrimination rests in middle management, and for us that was the senior editors. But there were certainly editors at the top. There were four top editors. The editor-in-chief, a man named Osborne Elliott, um, who has three daughters, and I have a theory about men with daughters, told me later that he knew that Monday the women were right. Unfortunately, the statement he released in response to our lawsuit was one he wishes he hadn't. It said the fact that virtually all the writers were men and all the researchers were women was a news magazine tradition that went back 50 years. Now, that just sort of underlied the institutional sexism of both right, time right. and Newsweek. Um, and there were- Black people have always been slaves <laughs> in this country. <laughs> yes, exactly. you know, so, so, right. Um, yes, he right. said he wished he hadn't said that. Uh, the, a couple of the top editors, one of them we heard said, why don't we just fire them all? Um, and so we knew that you know, we were gonna have a tough time at that level of the magazine. And uh, how about Kay Graham? I mean. You know, Eleanor Holmes Norton at the press conference, our lawyer, immediately asked that Catherine Graham is one of the two women who owned major media at the time, the other being Dorothy Schiff, who owned the, Wash the New York Post, that she come to the negotiations. And she declined, saying she would have the men who ran the magazine come. But she did come to one meeting uh, while we were negotiating. So you were basically filing uh, the first complaint. You filed a complaint with the EEOC. Did you also uh, file with the New York State Division? That no, was the second that time that was around. the second time. Okay, but basically there was this new set of civil rights laws that pre prohibited employment discrimination against women, and set up a mechanism for complaints and 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 for lawsuits. So, so after several months of negotiations, you reached a memorandum of understanding with Newsweek, signed in August 1970, basically saying they were going to affirmatively seek out women, uh, including current women employees for reporting and writing tryouts. They would integrate the research department with men. They would identify women who had the potential to be the first woman senior editor. And then nothing much happened, right? <laughs> right. Uh, the first few women on the staff who tried out as writers failed. And we just think because the men didn't really want them to succeed. Um, there were some women who went to bureaus and ultimately were promoted to reporters. But not all the women also, you know, could make the transition. There was a woman who was asked to be a, promo a, a, a reporter, but she just really wanted to be a researcher, mm -hmm. so she turned it down. Then she was asked to be a writer. She was very talented, Trish Riley, and she just didn't want to. She just wanted to be a researcher, and, you know, the women's movement didn't work for all women. Right. But the, the guys did nothing. The number I remember a year and a half into it was that there were four women hired from the outside, or three women hired from the outside as writers, a woman promoted from inside, so there were five women writing, including myself. And at the same time, they had hired 15 male writers. So we were really frustrated. I was on the negotiating committee, and we just voted to sue again, which we did in 1973. So you hired a new lawyer, Harriet Rapp from Columbia. Um, what was she like? Harriet was great. I mean, 
Harriet was also 27 and like pregnant. Um, Actually, we seemed I, to hire. I know because I think she was, I went to Columbia Law School. I think she was there when yeah, I was there. Yeah, she was ended up as the first woman right. dean there. But, right. but at the time she was running an employment rights clinic, which was unheard of at the time. This was still 1973. Um, and Harriet came in and by this time, uh, it was a very quantitative approach to our problem. We had depositions, we had patterns of discrimination, and she employed goals and timetables, which was then being employed far more in employment rights discrimination cases. So this time we said we want a third of the writers and the reporters to be women, a third of the researchers to be men, and a woman senior editor by the end of 1975. Goals and timetables scared the hell out of a lot of companies. <laughs> um, but I mean, you probably couldn't, wouldn't get anywhere without them. You know, I always say I'm an affirmative action baby. I am very proud of the fact that my, the opportunities would not have happened to me without affirmative action, however you want to call it. And Anna Quinlan said to me not long ago, we were talking about, she also identifies herself as an affirmative action person. And Gail Collins always says, you know, she never would have gotten her, her job unless the women had sued at the Newsweek and the New York Times. But Anna said to me, you know, people don't understand that. And I always, and she always says, if you think affirmative action means you're going to get a mediocre, second talented person simply because they're a woman or because they're black, you're looking at one. So it, it's, a, it's a very complicated for, for a lot of people. Um, for us, it, it was a lifesaver. But also, if you don't have some kind of numerical guide, standard, you know, then nothing really happens. And in our profession, it's hard because it's a subjective profession. Anybody could look at a piece of writing or reporting and say, you know, it's just not very good. And unlike a lot of businesses where you can actually quantify billable hours, how your fund is doing, you know, evaluations, journalism is very subjective. So you reached an agreement signed in June 73 um, that by December of, of 74, Four, one third of the writers and the domestic reporters would be women. By the end of 75, one out of three people hired or sent to staff foreign bureaus as correspondents would be women. And that by December 75th, Newsweek would hire a female senior editor to be in charge of one of the six editorial sections. They also set up a training program to train women, to train women writers. That uh, sounds pretty radical. You know, why did Newsweek agree to it? Well. Catherine Graham, who, as I said, was the owner of the Post, which owned Newsweek. Catherine Graham, at that point in 1973, was being sued by the blacks at the Washington Post for not having enough black editors in management or probably even reporters. The women at the Washington Post had been very unhappy for several years and had been writing letters to management. And in fact, they sued two years after we did. And I think by that point, you know, Catherine Graham, if you know her story, sort of, although she had been a reporter young in her life and was a very intelligent woman. She had basically gone home to raise four children when her husband died and came back to keep the, magaz the, the newspaper and the, news and the company in the family. And as she describes it in her own book, she was a very insecure woman. And so when we first sued, she just didn't know what to do. She famously said when told that the women at Newsweek sued in 1970, which side am I supposed to be on? By 1973, she had then been running the Post Company for some 10 years. She had met Gloria Steinem, who she credits with, uh, in her book as saying that she was the person who most explained the women's movement to her and made her understand what that was about. And so I think she just decided, this is ridiculous. These, why wasn't this fixed? Go up there and settle this. And she asked her corporate lawyer, who was then Joe Califano, who later became um, secretary of HEW under Johnson, to, to go up and basically settle the suit. Did you get any, did you have any uh, men at Newsweek, either editors or colleagues, male colleagues, who said of women, you know, you only got that job because you're a woman? Did you get any of that kind of? Well, I had, I had a, a writer who I, when I ended up trying out as a senior editor and becoming a senior editor, came to me uh, and said, you know, I was really against you getting this job because I'm against affirmative action. But I have to tell you that I think you're doing a good job and I think you're not using it just as a stepping stone to the next job, which is what a lot of guys sort of passing through. And I have to tell you that <laughs> 
when I go to my son's Little League games or I want to get time off, I would never tell that to a man. I would say I had a doctor's appointment or something, but I'll tell you, I need to go to my son's Little League game on Wednesday. And so there was some rapprochement, even among people who were sort of against it all. Mm -hmm. So who benefited from the new agreement? Who, or were some of the success stories? Well, I, I think a lot, first of all, a lot of the women um, opened, I mean, there were women who then suddenly, Eleanor Clift, who was secretary in the Atlanta Bureau when we first sued, became the first woman who covered the president in the White House not the first lady. We had women who covered the war, Elizabeth. So she went from, from sort of secretary well, office manager? She was a, became a reporter, and she started covering Jimmy Carter in Atlanta. And when Jimmy Carter became president, she became the White House. The first mm -hmm. time a woman covered a president for Newsweek. We had um, a woman, Elizabeth Peer, who ended up covering the war in Somalia, um, first sort of war correspondent. She had wanted to cover the war in Vietnam, and they wouldn't set a, send a woman. We had Elaine Shalino, who had been hired as a researcher in the international thing and who flew to um, Iran on the same plane as Ayatollah Khomeini in 1979 and ended up covering Iran and the hostage crisis. So doors started opening for a lot of women. A woman became uh, Rome bureau chief, Boston bureau chief. There were a lot of firsts. And of course, they hired a lot of women as well. And I always say, the years between 75 and 85, doors just opened for women everywhere in this country. I mean, lots of companies realized they better have women or else. And so people had a lot of opportunity at that time. We're going to take a short break, and then we'll be back with more with Lynn Povich, author of The Good Girls Revolt, How the Women of Newsweek Suit Their Bosses and Change the Workplace, after the following message. I first started skating with my friend. He had an extra board, and then he just gave it to me, and I've been skating ever since. Well, when I don't learn a trick, and I have my mind set on something, and I'm not getting what I want, I just keep going for it until I get it right. She didn't go to college, so she wants me to experience that whole thing, and so I could end up getting, like, a good job. I think to get into college, I'll have to be determined, just like when I want to get a new trick, and skating's helped me realize I've got what it takes. Welcome back to One to One. I'm Cheryl McCarthy at the City University of New York, and I'm talking with Lynn Povich, author of The Good Girls Revolt, How the Women of Newsweek Suit Their Bosses and Change the Workplace. It's just been published by Public Affairs Books. So how did you benefit from the lawsuit? How did it affect you? Well, they had to have a woman senior editor by the end of 1975. And I was always told that the first person they asked was Gloria Steinem who was by then editing her own magazine. It, I don't think being a senior editor at Newsweek was so appealing. But Gloria said to me, you know, they probably asked me because I was like Jose Greco, the only Spanish dancer they knew. So they tried out a woman before me, one of, a very brilliant reporter and writer named Elizabeth Peer. Um, she tried out as the first. She was the most senior, and she was a terrifically talented woman. She just wasn't an editor, and she wasn't a manager. And so they asked me to try out uh, in the spring of 1975, um, and I did. And then in August of 1975, Osborne Elliott moved up to be editor-in-chief, and Ed Kozner became the new editor, and he promoted me in August of 1975. Okay. And you took the, and over what sections were you? Well, I was in a series of the back of the book section. So I did press, uh, media, lifestyle, religion, ideas. And you accepted that job over mo moving to L.A. to be with your then-husband. Yes. I had, a, I had a choice to make. My husband was then, my then-husband was a filmmaker. Um, he had moved to L.A. We had kind of been commuting back and forth. And I was about to move to L.A. Um, and then I got this opportunity. And so I said to him, I really have to stay in New York um, to do this. And so he ended up coming back to New York, and I never went. But 
we were trying to sort of resolve our marriage and live in the same city one way or the other. So after the Newsweek lawsuit, uh, women at other news organizations followed. Um, there was a, the famous <laughs> women's takeover, the Ladies Home Journal office. Um, was that, what was it, was that in 72? Yeah, that was in no, no, that was 1970. Well? That was like okay. a couple weeks after right, we right, did. Right, right, right. Uh, there were lawsuits by the women at Newsday, the New York Times, Time Magazine, NBC, I think the Baltimore Sun, but other places as well. Um, and the management at some of the other news organizations were not, shall we say, as gentlemanly as they had been at, at Newsweek? Yes, I mean, I know this from Harriet Rabb because Harriet represented the women at the Reader's Digest and the women at the New York Times. And she said they were pretty brutal, um, particularly the, the Times we talked about a lot because that was a very important case. The New York and, Times. The New York Times. Okay. And, and they were pretty tough on that women, uh, on the women there. And unfortunately, they settled the case in the end. But the women on the front lines of those case, of, of that particular case, and the women on the front lines of most of these cases were not the ones that benefited. I mean, their careers stalled, they got frozen out, there were repercussions, they were shunted off to some backwater of the paper. Um, and it was, it was really difficult. I see Betsy Wade, you know, who led the uh, revolt at the Times on, on the street a lot, <laughs> and um, she, told you it was the most important thing that she ever did in her career, leading that lawsuit. I do, think, you, do you feel the same way? I think we all feel the same way. I think we are all so proud that we did what we did, and we are sort of still amazed we were so young and actually did it. Um, but yes, we feel like we opened the doors for women in our profession. And of course, once you open the door in the media, and the media is a reflection of society, and now the coverage of women changes because there are women writing about it. There are women editors. There are women assigning stories. There are women bringing new ideas to the table. I feel that having more women in the media changed the workplace in general. Do women now comprise the majority of people in the news business? Are they a majority now? You know, um, the International Women's Media Foundation, on which I am the board, um, did a global status report on women in the news media. And they are not over 50% in most um, categories, either reporters or writers, and certainly not at the top. They have been the majority in journalism schools since the 80s, probably the 70s. But of course, as you know, not, journal, not all journalists come from journalism schools, right. unlike law schools and business schools. So there are a lot of women in our profession, but there's still very few women at the top. How are they doing, well, uh, how are they doing in terms of, of, of salaries and, I mean, to follow up with that, and, and in positions of real power? Salaries I don't know because, um, you know, there's always a range within a category. Um, and I'm not, I don't have salary information for reporters and writers. It's very hard to get. They certainly are not at the, I mean, the glass ceiling now in most companies and certainly in most media companies is at senior management level. Um, they, there's, you know, there is a, now a woman editor of Newsweek, Tina Brown, who has made the editor, who became the editor in 2010. So that's 40 years after our lawsuit. So that's like two generations of women. Um, there's a woman editor uh, at the New York Times, um, Jill Abramson. But, you know, there are very few women running media organizations. There are very few women who run network news organizations, cable news organizations except for public television has had a woman. Um, and in general, the Fortune 500 just came out with their list of powerful women, and it's still in the teens. Sheryl Sandberg of Facebook said that in the corporate suite, women have been 15 to 17% for the last 10 years. So it, it's not moving. You, all could, you also could, might argue, that the news business is on a downward swing, some people say. and one often finds that when a profession becomes less hot, now journalism was hot in the 70s and 80s, when it becomes less hot, you know, and, 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 and men, start, men started moving out of it and then they moved into, I guess, finance was the area they went into, then, move, then women move in to fill the, the gap. Is, is that what's happened with the news business, do you think? I don't know, um, because, 
you know, there, as I said, there are a lot of women in the business. I don't know, first of all, what's, gonna ha what's happening to our business, as you well know, is this disruption between print and digital. Right. So it would be important to look at the digital side of the business, which is where the growth is going to come from and is the future, to sort of see where women are in the digital side of the news business. Um, you know, I, I still think, although there are a lot of women in journalism schools learning the digital side and are coming out with these skills, they're the younger women. Mm -hmm. So there is this transition between the more experienced reporters and writers who may not have as many skills as younger people. You've had some high-level jobs since you left Newsweek. Um, what that had been possible, do you think, without the lawsuits that women filed in the 70s? Well, first of all, I wouldn't have become a senior editor at Newsweek. And because I was a senior editor at Newsweek, I got hired to be the editor-in-chief of Working Woman magazine. So everything leads to something else. Right. And I'm incredibly grateful to the lawsuits and to the women who had the courage to file them. You open your book writing about two, several female Newsweek staffers in 2009 who experienced their own click moment, Jessica, Jesse, and Sarah. Uh, grew up in the era of women's empowerment and yet found it difficult to get stories into the magazine, found that they were being paid, in some cases, being paid less than male employees at the magazine. So what does their, what does their experience tell us? Well, as I say, like the civil rights movement, the women's movement hasn't solved everything. There's still a lot of uh, uh, ways to go before we get true equality. Um, What's interesting to me is that they were feeling certain frustrations that we felt. They were feeling they weren't listened to. They saw young men with same qualifications or less getting better assignments, moving ahead faster. Um, and yet, as you said, they grew up being told they could do anything and be anything. And so they didn't see it as discrimination because the sex wars were over and now we were all equal. And so they weren't sure what it was, and again, like mo many women, tended to blame themselves. They thought, well, we must not be good enough, or we must not be talented enough. That's how we felt, too. Um, and so by discovering our case and talking to us, I think it sort of opened up their eyes to realize it's not them, it's the system, and the system needs to get fixed. Mm -hmm. So what do you think it's going to take to get there? Well, I think in many in many companies, media and otherwise, it's still an old, an old boys club. I think that corporate culture comes from the top. And so if you have a man who's running a company and respects and likes women, enjoys working with them, he promotes them. And if you have a guy who's comfortable around guys and talks to guys and his sources are guys, they don't do so well. And I think that um, we have to change the corporate culture. We have to provide benefits and flexibility for working parents, men and women, because it's really hard to be in your 30s with two kids with a full-time job, especially in our profession, and do both really well. And we, we lose a lot of skilled people because they choose not to go into these jobs. I know many women who've turned down top jobs because they don't know how they can do it. We've got about a minute left. What advice do you have for women journalists who feel they're still getting the shaft? I think they have to quantify what the issues are so that they can show its pattern. It's not a personal complaint. It's not what they feel. And then I think they have to take these, uh, this, this data and, and take it to someone in management. And if they feel they can't or they get no response, then I think they should think about having a lawyer call on their behalf. And, and in both cases, were both of your lawyers, did they do the work pro bono? In, in both cases? They did. Harriet asked for the, her fees to be paid to the Columbia Law School um, Employment Rights Clinic. Fascinating story. Takes me back. <laughs> <laughs> We're out of time. I want to thank Lynn Povich for joining me today. The Good Girls Revolt, How the Women of Newsweek Sued Their Bosses and Changed the Workplace, has just been published by Public Affairs Books for the City University of New York and One to One. I'm Cheryl McCarthy.
people you'd like to hear from or topics you'd like us to explore, please let us know. You can write to me at CUNY TV, 365 Fifth Avenue, New York, New York, 10016, or you can go to the website at cuny.tv and click on Contact Us. I look forward to hearing from you.